Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's REI Network webinar, Boosting Financial Stability Through Tax Credits. My name is Elizabeth Jennings. I'm the Director of Training and Technical Assistance here at National Disability Institute, and I'm going to be today's moderator. I'm going to invite my colleague, Nakia Matthews, to offer you a few housekeeping tips before we get started. Thank you, Elizabeth, and good afternoon, everyone. The audio for today's webinar is being broadcast through your computer. Please make sure that your speakers are turned on or your headphones are plugged in. You can control the audio broadcast via the audio broadcast panel, which you see below. And if you accidentally close this panel or if the sound stops, you can reopen it by going to communicate at the, the communicate menu at the top of the screen and choosing join audio broadcast. If you do not have sound capabilities on your computer, or if you prefer to listen by phone, you can dial the toll or toll-free number that you see here and enter the meeting code. Please note that you do not need to enter an attendee ID. Real-time captioning is provided during this webinar. The captions can be found in the media viewer panel, which appears in the lower right corner of the webinar platform. If you'd like to make the media viewer panel larger, you can do so by minimizing some of the other panels like chat or Q&A. And conversely, if you do not need the captions, you can minimize the media viewer panel. We will have time for questions at the end of the webinar. Please use the Q&A box or the chat box to send any questions you may have during the course of the webinar to either Elizabeth Jennings or myself, Nakia Matthews, and we will direct those questions accordingly during the Q&A portion. If you are listening by phone and not logged into the web portion, you may also ask questions by emailing Elizabeth directly at ejennings at ndi-inc.org. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and that the materials will be placed on the NDI website at the URL below. If you experience any technical difficulties during this webinar, please use the chat box to send me, Nakia Matthews, a message, or you may email me directly at nmatthews at ndi-inc.org. Thank you, Nakia. Before we get started, we'd also like to give a special thank you to the sponsors of the Real Economic Impact Network, Walmart, Bank of America, Accorda Therapeutics, the Burton Blatt Institute at Syracuse University, and the IRS. For those of you who are new to our webinars, National Disability Institute is a national research and development organization with the mission to promote income preservation and asset development for persons with disabilities and to build a better economic future for Americans with disabilities. We invite you, if you haven't already, to join our Real Economic Impact Network. It is an alliance of organizations and individuals dedicated to advancing the economic empowerment of people with disabilities, all coming together to embrace, promote, and pursue access to and inclusion of people with disabilities in the economic mainstream. Through the network, we provide many things, including today's webinar. We also do a monthly newsletter, and we're willing to offer technical assistance to you as you learn and seek ways to implement what you learn through your own services. Today, we're going to talk about tax credit basics, including the earned income tax credit, child tax credit, and the premium tax credit, free filing options, opportunities to improve tax credit outreach activities, resources to support tax credit outreach, and we're going to leave time for questions and answers. If you should have a question that doesn't get answered today, or you have a question after the webinar ends, you're always welcome to reach out to us at NDI. Um, again, you can reach out to me, Elizabeth Jennings, at ejennings at ndi-inc.org. We're really thrilled today to have with us two women from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, Roxy Keynes, who's the Earned Income Credit Campaign Director, and Jenny Hung, who's the Earned Income Credit Outreach Assistant. Uh, we just want to give a thank you to both of you for joining us today, and a thank you to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities for their continued partnership and their strides in this area. So welcome, Roxy and Jenny. Hi, thank you so much for having us. This is Roxy Keynes, and I'll be going over some of the basics about the tax credits before turning it over to Jenny, who will discuss outreach opportunities and resources to support your work. 
So first, we'll begin by exploring the earned income credit and the child tax credit. The earned income credit, also known as the EIC, and the child tax credit, also known as the CTC, are federal tax benefits for lower and moderate income workers, including families and individuals. These credits help to offset income and payroll taxes, supplement wages, and they also provide a work incentive. And later on, we'll have a chance to see how a work incentive is built into the structure of the earned income tax credit. Some of the key features of these tax benefits and why they're important is that they help to reduce any taxes that workers may owe. And even if workers don't owe taxes, they still may be eligible for a refund. Some workers get both the earned income credit and the child tax credit. So these tax benefits are refundable, which is a very important point to note how they contrast compared to non-refundable tax credits. With a non-refundable tax credit, let's say, for example, you have a non-refundable tax credit that's worth $1,000 and someone owes $300 in taxes. Well, that $300 is eliminated and then there's $700 that goes unclaimed and is unused with that non-refundable tax credit. Refundable tax credits are different because in that same example with the $1,000 refundable tax credit, if someone owes $300, that $300 in income tax liability is eliminated and that remaining $700 the worker would receive, they would get to keep. And so this is one of the reasons why refundable tax credits are so important and why we have an outreach initiative to help promote them. One way that the credits help boost financial stability is by helping to move people out of poverty. So in 2013, the Earned Income Credit and Child Tax Credit listed 9.4 million people above the poverty line. This includes 4.9 million children. Research shows that people who claim these tax credits use them to support themselves and help care for their families. Popular ways to use refunds from the earned income credit and child tax credit include paying for child care, rent and utilities, transportation costs, auto repairs, basic needs including food, clothing and shelter, as well as medical expenses. So these credits are important because they help workers be able to keep working and care for themselves and their families. So why is outreach actually needed? Well, when we look at the earned income credit, we can see that nationally it is estimated that 75 to 80 percent of people who are eligible for the earned income credit actually claim it. This means that 20 to 25 percent of people who are eligible are not receiving this tax benefit. Now, when you look at the overall take-up rate, it may seem like that's pretty good to, have, to be able to reach 75 to 80 percent of people. That 20 to 25 percent, however, translates to an estimated as much as $10 billion being unclaimed in earned income credit refunds. So this is money, again, that is not reaching people who are eligible for the credit to be able to use to support themselves and their families. So this is why outreach is needed. So let's take a closer look at the earned income tax credit. The earned income credit is adjusted for inflation each year. So for tax year 2014, which is the year we're currently in and we'll be filing taxes for next year, this slide shows the maximum amount that the earned income credit is worth in the right-hand column, the income, income guidelines in the middle column, and the family structure in the left-hand column. So these are factors that contribute to determining how much an earned income credit refund is worth. So for workers with three or more children, the earned income credit is worth a maximum of $6,143. 
And the income guidelines in the middle are for single workers, so for someone earning less than about $47,000. For two children, the maximum EIC is, 4, 000, is excuse me, is $5,460. For someone earning about 43700 for someone raising one child and earning about 38500 the maximum is $3,305. And for workers without children learning, earning about $14,600, less than $14,600, the maximum EIC is worth up to $496. So the income guidelines in the middle column are $5,430 higher for married workers filing jointly. You cannot claim the earned income credit if you file married filing separately. Also to note is that for workers not raising children, they must be between the ages of 25 and 64. There are no age requirements for adults claiming the earned income credit who will be claiming children as well. Uh, there are age requirements for the children and we'll have a, a closer look at those shortly. And the other consideration in determining eligibility for the earned income credit is that one cannot have investment income that exceeds $3,350. When we talk about investment income, this would be the interest off of earnings for investment income. So not just having something saved away, but any interest off of stocks and bonds and capital gains distributions, for example. So if someone has investment income that exceeds $3,350, even if their income is below these amounts, they would not be eligible to claim the earned income credit. Another thing to note is that these income guidelines are the maximum amount. There is not a minimum amount that one must earn to claim the earned income credit. So, for example, if someone earns $1, they may be eligible to claim this tax credit. So this chart shows a little bit of how the earned income credit is structured and how a work incentive is built into the design of this credit. Along the horizontal axis is the income amount, and the credit amount is along the vertical axis. So here you can see the way that credit is structured for workers without children, which is represented by the dark blue. One child is the light blue, the orange color is two children, and the light beige color is for three or more children. And so the more you work and the more you earn and travel along that horizontal axis, the larger your credit amount is. Then it reaches a point where it plateaus and it slowly declines and, and phases you out of the earned income credit. It's different from other benefits in that it doesn't immediately cut you off if you earn $1 more than you did the previous year. This chart includes uh, dotted lines, which represent the guidelines for workers who are married filing jointly. The earned income credit can be worth even more for states that have a state earned income credit. 24 states, including the District of Columbia, have a state earned income credit. And state EICs are a percentage of the federal credit. So it, this chart shows the percentages next to each state. Those listed in green are non-refundable, and all of the other states are refundable credits. So if you live in one of these states, your earned income credit could be worth even more by also claiming the state earned income credit. So now let's take a look at the child tax credit. So the child tax credit works first as a non-refundable credit in that it reduces or eliminates any income tax owed or withheld. 
then it works as a refundable credit and any remaining amount of the child tax credit is provided as an additional child tax credit refund. The child tax credit is structured differently from the earned income credit and here you can see what the income guidelines are and the value of the credit. So if workers earn more than $3,000, that's when the refundable portion of the child tax credit will kick in. It's worth up to $1,000 for each qualifying child, and there is not a maximum of qualifying children that can be claimed for the child tax credit. This chart shows income guidelines to receive that maximum benefit of $1,000 for each qualifying child. So any earnings that someone may have beyond this, they still may be eligible for a child tax credit. It would just be worth a smaller amount. So let's take a look at eligibility. There are some similarities between the earned income credit and the child tax credit. As the name of the earned income credit uh, notes, you must have earned income to claim these credits. So earned income generally refers to wages, salaries, and tips from a job. It can also include self-employment, union strike benefits, employer-paid disability benefits, and military combat pay. Earned income does not include non-taxable earned income. It does not include public benefits, including Social Security, SSI, and welfare. And it does not include other forms of income, such as unemployment, interest on bank accounts, alimony and child support, and investment income. Now, if someone has a combination of things on the right-hand column and on the left-hand column, they may be eligible for the tax credit. However, if one only has Social Security, for example, as a source of income, they would not be eligible to claim the tax credits if that's their only source of income. To claim the credits, uh, both working full-time, part-time, or self-employed, if someone's only worked a couple of days throughout the year or worked sporadically throughout the year, they may be eligible as well. Again, you can claim the tax credits and receive public benefits, be single or married, raising a qualifying child, or also, or uh, there's the earned income credit for workers w without children. And then immigrants legally authorized to work can claim both the earned income credit and the child tax credit as well. For the earned income credit, one must have a social security number that authorizes work. This applies to the worker filing the tax return, a spouse if present, as well as any children claimed as well. For the child tax credit only, immigrants who have individual taxpayer identification numbers, also known as ITINs, may also claim the child tax credit. And that applies to both the taxpayer, spouse, and children. The child tax credit is also available to some non-custodial parents. So the definition of a qualifying child, there are three criteria that help determine a qualifying child. One is the relationship, two is the residence, and three is the age of the child. So these credits can benefit many different types of workers. A qualifying child includes son, daughter, grandchild, stepchild, adopted child, brother, sister, stepbrother, stepsister, or their descendants, as well as a foster child placed by a government or private agency. The qualifying child must live with the worker in the U.S. for more than half the year. This uh, time does not have to be continuous. At the end of the year, however, it must add up to more than half the year. And one place where the credits differ is that for the earned income credit, a child can be under age 19 or under 24 if they're a full-time student. They can also be any age if they are considered totally and permanently disabled. 
And the IRS uses the same definition of totally and permanent, of having a total and permanent disability as is used for uh, Social Security disability. For the child tax credit, a child must be under 17. And if you are a qualifying child, you cannot claim the earned income credit for yourself. Also, if a child is claimed for both the earned income credit and the child tax credit, child tax credit, it is the same worker who must file for both credits. So one note is that uh, sometimes people are concerned about claiming the refunds if they are receiving public benefits. So current rules state that federal tax refunds do not count as income for any program receiving federal funding. And refunds that are saved do not count against any resource limits or asset tests for 12 months after the refund is received. So how do the credits work? Well, let's take a look at some examples. So we have Craig, who is single and 41 years old. He earned $5,000 in 2014, and he does not owe any income tax. His earned income credit refund is $384. And next we have Maxine. Maxine is a single mom raising a six-year-old son. She earns $19,000 in 2014. She has $200 in income tax withheld. Her total earned income credit and child tax credit refund is $4,114. So these are two examples to get an idea of the value of the credit. Now there are two important things, or one important thing that both Maxine and Craig had to do to actually receive these tax refunds. They had to file a tax return. So that is the requirement to be able to receive these benefits. There's not an application, there's not an interview process, but you must file a tax return. And if you're claiming the earned income credit for, with children, you will also include the Schedule EIC. If you're filing for the child tax credit, you'll also include the Schedule 8812. Uh, one thing that is very key to outreach is that eligible workers can claim the earned income credit and child tax credit refund for up to three previous years, as long as they were eligible in each of those years. So as I mentioned before, the earned income credit is adjusted for inflation each year. So if someone met the income guidelines for those previous years, then they can claim those credits as well. And if they didn't file a tax return in the previous years, they would just file one for those tax years. If someone did file for those previous years and realizes that they did not receive the tax credits and they were eligible for them, then they can amend their tax return to get those refunds. Okay, so let's talk about filing for free. So most people, when it's time to file a tax return, will go seek out help from a commercial preparer. And 65% of earned income credit recipients use commercial tax preparation. There are fees that range depending on the preparer from $85 to $120 for just the e-filing alone. There are some tax preparers that will add on additional fees and some will also use what's called, offer what's called refund anticipation loans or refund anticipation checks. Refund anticipation loans are on the decline. I want to start by saying that if anyone on this uh, webinar is familiar with refund anticipation loans, they do still exist. So currently they are very high interest loans that are arranged by a commercial tax preparer with a payday lender or a non-bank business. In the past there was an arrangement made with another financial institution 
Currently, all financial institutions have pulled out of making these arrangements. However, commercial tax preparers are finding other ways to offer these routes. And so what happens is that a client has their taxes prepared and they ha receive what the preparer says their refund will be in the time line that is quicker than the IRS can actually process the return. When the IRS does process the return, if they determine that the refund amount is less than what the client already receives, it is the client who is stuck paying the difference of the refund amount that they received and the actual refund, as well as paying the interest on this um, loan. So they're very dangerous because there's no guarantee that the refund will equal the amount of the loan. So now um, more commercial tax preparers are turning to refund anticipation checks, which has the commercial tax preparers set up a temporary bank account and have their refund deposited there. And once the refund is deposited, they will give the refund to the client minus a certain number of fees. And the problem with this, the concern with this, is that it's no faster than direct deposit, and still the commercial tax preparer can subtract fees, so it means that a worker will not get the full benefit of their refund. So there are alternatives. Volunteer Income Tax Assistance, or which is also known as VITA, provides free tax filing services in communities across the country. There's also a program, Tax Counseling for the Elderly, as well, which often is available in conjunction with AARP's Tax Aid Program that makes free tax preparation available uh, throughout the country. Another option is MyFreeTaxes.com, which you'll hear about a little later on. So one other important tax benefit is that we have this new tax benefit called the premium tax credit. This is one of the provisions under the Affordable Care Act that helps make health insurance available to more people. So the premium tax credit provides assistance with the cost of health care for people who purchase coverage through the health insurance marketplace, um, the federal health insurance marketplace or through one of their state marketplaces. There's an option uh, to receive this credit in advance. And by doing this, uh, the IRS pays monthly a certain portion to the private insurance plan company chosen through the marketplace, and then consumers may have a monthly premium contribution as well. When they file their tax return, uh, they can reconcile these amounts and some people will receive a refund. Premiums are limited to two percent to 9.5 percent of family income. Currently, we are in the open enrollment period for health insurance coverage for 2015. It started November 15th and continues to February 15th, and it's during this time that people who are uninsured have a chance to purchase health insurance and may be eligible for the premium tax credit. There are four primary criteria for eligibility for the tax credit, for the premium tax credit. The so one is that someone must be enrolled in a marketplace plan. Two is that one must have income between 100% and 400% of the federal poverty line. And so with this, um, there is one exception in that lawfully present immigrants with income under the poverty line are eligible for premium tax credits if they are ineligible for Medicaid because of their immigration status. And this generally is that someone has not been in the country for a five-year period. So what counts as income when we're talking about having income 100 to 400 percent of the poverty line? This, re this is based on modified adjusted gross income. So modified adjusted gross income is a combination of adjusted gross income plus non-taxable Social Security benefits plus tax-exempt interest plus any excluded foreign income. Now, Social Security payments, including disability 
payments do count as income. And for the purposes of someone who is applying for uh, health insurance for the first time and may be applying or, and may be eligible for premium tax credits, if one has not actually received a decision on their disability status, then they should not include SSDI in their estimated income. Only include it if you actually are already receiving it. The remaining criteria for premium tax credits are that one must have an eligible filing and dependent status. Similar to the earned income credit, one cannot be married filing separately. Must be married filing jointly or single or head of household, have one of those um, filing statuses. And then one cannot be a dependent uh, to receive the premium tax credit. Finally, one must be ineligible for minimum essential coverage, which includes most public and employer-sponsored coverage. So just a little bit more about what is minimum essential coverage. So as of 2014, there is a requirement that most people must have health insurance and this is identified as minimum essential coverage, and it must be reported on your tax return. In general, coverage for one day equals coverage for the entire month. So if someone finds that they have coverage or there's been changes in their coverage uh, in the middle of a month, this is how it's counted. If you have it for one day in that month, then you have it for the entire month. This chart shows more on what counts as, uh, as minimum essential coverage and what does not. So in the left-hand column, we can see most employer-sponsored coverage, individual health insurance, and government-sponsored plans, including Medicare, most Medicaid, and CHIP. In the right-hand uh, box, we see limited benefits that are not counted as minimum essential coverage. This includes limited benefit Medicaid plans. So having Medicaid uh, does count as MEC for the most part. However, if you have a limited benefit Medicaid plan, then it may not be covered. There is an exemption available for 2014 for some of these, and uh, after that, one will have to make sure that they have other forms of minimum essential coverage. So some people who do not have minimum essential coverage for the entire year will have to pay a penalty to the IRS. And this penalty, uh, is enforced regardless of disability status. And so if someone finds that they do not have minimum essential coverage, they may be eligible for an exemption from the penalty. There are more than 14 types of exemptions, including low-income Medicaid ineligibility because when state didn't expand, medical expense debt, unaffordable insurance choices, homeless, and ineligible immigrants. So there's a link here that will allow you to see more of, on the different types of exemptions that are available. So another way that health insurance is available in addition to the premium tax credits is through Medicaid expansion. States that have chosen to expand will now have Medicaid available primarily to newly eligible adults, including parents, whether or not they work, and adults without dependent children. The Medicaid expansion allows people with income within 138% of the poverty line to be eligible. This chart shows the current lay of the land with the number of states that have expanded Medicaid and those that have not. So one other tax benefit that may be of use is the Child and Dependent Care Credit. So this tax benefit is a non-refundable benefit in that it reduces income tax uh, that one may owe. And it's specifically for any expenses one incurs to care for a child or a dependent with disabilities to be able to work. 
The maximum expenses are $3,000 for one dependent and $6,000 for two or more. And the credit is worth a percentage of expenses depending on income. 26 states also have their own credit, and in 12 of these states, the credit is refundable. So now I'm going to turn it over to Jenny to talk more about what you can do now that you know the basics about these tax credits. She's going to share some of the outreach opportunities available. Thank you, Roxy. So I'm sure now you all know all about how tax credits work and you can share it with your clients and colleagues. So as an organization serving people with disabilities, you can absolutely help promote the tax credits without being a tax expert. A great way to do this is to incorporate these outreach activities into your daily work routines and to encourage your partners to do the same. Finally, you can build partnerships to expand your outreach efforts. So you can talk to clients about the tax credits when they come in to see you. So you'll want to have on hand eligibility guidelines, local VITA locations, and a list of navigators and assister agencies in your area who can help clients um, with the marketplace. How you can do this is by handing flyers out to clients as they come in, displaying posters in your offices, or including notices in your newsletters that you send out, either e-newsletters or through the mail. A lot of these promotional materials are available on our website, eitcoutreach.org, as well as eligibility guidelines and a link to the VITA sites in your area. All of these um, links I'll be discussing in a later slide. So let's go back to the ACA for a moment. When clients come in, you'll want to make sure that you ask them if they have health insurance for the year. If they don't have health insurance, you'll want to direct them to the marketplace or to um, navigators and assister agencies in your area. If you look on the link localhelp.healthcare.gov, you can go there to find agencies who can help you. If they are enrolled, check to make sure they know to report income and family changes to the marketplace. When the family or the income changes, their tax credit, their ACA tax credit may change and they'll want to report that immediately. In addition to sharing tax credit information with your clients, you can also reach out to your colleagues. A great time to do this would be during staff meetings where you can hand out flyers with more information or include a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, on our website, you'll find this PowerPoint available. You can also use technology to post tax credit information on your intranet or include tax credit information uh, as your e-signature and tell your coworkers to do the same. So we have a few examples here like do you know about tax benefits for people who work? Or why pay when you can file your taxes for free? And make sure, again, that you have the information available so you can pass it on to others. You can also expand your outreach by building partnerships and pooling resources. Informing partner agencies about the EIC and CTC is very helpful. You can include, you can um, share flyers and promotional materials with these partner agencies as well as information about their credits. If you are a nonprofit, you can, uh, you can partner with a VITA site to host a free tax help day and also raise, by, uh, or also raise tax credit awareness. On January 30th of 2015, uh, there is a National Ta EITC Awareness Day. That is a great time to start using social media to inform people about free, uh, free tax filing as well as tax credit awareness. As always, social media is a great tool to get the word out. Okay. 
So I'm going to share a few examples of organizations who have reached, who have done a great job um, reaching out to people with disabilities. To start, we have Goodwill Hawaii. They conduct an annual survey to make sure they're addressing all the accessibility issues in their VITA um, program. They host their own VITA services and they always try their best to make sure that everyone can access their services. Um, they've, after conducting their annual service, or survey rather, they started a shuttle bus program to pick up the clients um, from where the bus line ended. They've also moved all of their offices to the first floor to make sure that all clients can access their resources. And they have a sign language interpreter available for everyone who needs it. They also use the NDI's virtual toolkit to provide sensitivity training to all of their VITA volunteers. The Legal Aid Society of Greater Cincinnati is another example of great tax credit outreach. They partner with the Cincinnati Speech, Hearing, and Deaf Center for three days of free tax preparation to workers with disabilities, and they also have an ASL interpreter available. At their tax sites, they use dividers to maintain confidentiality for filers using sign language. Finally, we have Davenport University in Grand Rapids. They transport clients to their site from group homes for people with disabilities, as, and they also have mobile sites um, where they visit nursing homes to assist taxpayers who cannot travel to VITA sites themselves. So what are the tax credit outreach resources that you can use in your outreach? Well, one great way to start off is by connecting with your local tax credit outreach coalition. These coalitions promote the EIC and the CTC to provide free tax preparation services, and a lot of them also focus on asset building and financial education. To find, uh, to see if there is a partnership in your area, you can go to the website provided there, uh, which includes a local a directory of local partnerships by state. If you have any trouble connecting with a coalition, you can contact either Roxy or me. My email is jhuang at cbpp.org. That's j-h-u-a-n-g at cbpp.org. Or you can contact Roxy Keynes. Her email is C-A-I-N-E-S at cbpp.org, and we would be happy to help find another contact for you. You can also contact your IRS territory manager who can provide further information and resources for you. Another great resource is the REI Network's virtual toolkit. Uh, this toolkit provides disability awareness training for VITA volunteers and site coordinators. This is available either as an e-training or as a PowerPoint presentation. They have a very comprehensive social media guide. And finally, they have effective uh, outreach strategies from everything from marketing to people with disabilities to how to use people first language and then financial literacy training. And again, a link is provided there for you to access their resources. If a client comes in who has uh, an issue to resolve, you can send them to the low income taxpayer clinic. Um, these do have income eligibility requirements, so you should check up on that, but they can be very helpful. These cl clinics represent low income taxpayers before the IRS. They can help with audits, appeals, and collection disputes. They are not a routine tax preparation. They do not do routine tax preparation, so only go to them if you need help resolving a problem. And they are funded partly by IRS grants. So to find one, you can go to the PDF provided below. So finally, we have a list of quick links that you can access for more information on the ACA, um, on minimum essential coverage, as well as uh, the earned income credit. 
And of course, you can always go to the National Tax Credit Outreach Campaign's website, eitcoutreach.org, for more resources. Um, here you can find all of the promotional materials I was talking about before, from the flyers in different languages to posters and eligibility uh, guidelines and vital locations. To access the promotional materials, you'll want to go to the button that says Outreach Tools, and then under Materials, you'll find most of the uh, most of the posters and flyers. So with that, I will turn it back to Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Roxy and Jenny. That was a really great overview and very comprehensive. I was struck by how much we were able to learn in, in just 40 minutes. So kudos to both of you and thank you so much. Um, so everyone got a, a good amount of information. We wanted to just make one more um, suggestion, which is that we know that sometimes the the funding of your tax sites um, can be limited, and so there's another option for connecting people to free tax filing through MyFreeTaxes.com. This is just another way that you can um, offer free tax preparation, but maybe for individuals who are at a point where they can do their taxes a little bit more independently. Independently. Um, this is a free website. There's no gimmick to it. They're not going to get a pop-up saying, hey, now that you have money, why don't you buy this? Um, nothing of that nature. It's completely free and available to anybody who earned, I'm so sorry, I should have checked, but I believe it's under $58,000 this year, and which could include many of the people on site. Um, actually, it's $60,000. Thank you, Nakia. So um, it's a great resource, and there is a help desk if folks have any trouble as they're going through um, the process. So we have lots of times for questions and answers, and so if you haven't had a chance to put your questions in the Q&A box, now is the time to do that. But I'm going to go ahead and get started with some of the questions that have already come in. Um, so uh, one of the biggest questions we've gotten so far is how do I get a copy of the PowerPoint? So if you haven't had a chance to look in the chat box yet the, or the Q&A box, the link to uh, the posting of the PowerPoint is there. Also, we do have some questions that have come in. So for the taxpayer who is employed and has health insurance, how will he or she prove to the tax preparer that they have insurance if it is not reflected on their W-2? It's a great detailed question. Yes, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. So taxpayers that have uh, health insurance through their employer are not required to submit any documentation with their tax return for the next tax filing season. There will be new questions on the 1040, and there is a question that will ask, did you have health insurance and all year? And if you did, then you'll just check the box. Uh, in future years, employers will be required to send some type of documentation to employees showing what their health insurance coverage was. Uh, but for next year, there is not a requirement for that documentation. Thank you, Roxy. Okay, another question we've received is, I still have individuals on Social Security who are afraid to file their taxes. Is there anything I can share with them to help overcome their fear? Okay, so I think one aspect is understanding exactly what the fear is. So having a conversation um, would be very helpful in this case, and I would say providing some education on some of the benefits that are available, depending on if someone has uh, another form of income, then they would want to file a tax return because they may be eligible for these tax credit refunds. Uh, so that's often a place where uh, people who do have some type of fears about filing tax returns are able to become more engaged. If you want to send in a little bit more, if you do know what the fears are, then I may be able to share uh, something else with you. 
Thanks, Roxy. Just to add to that, um, you know, on, on National Disabilities website, realeconomicimpact.org, we have links to our webinars, and we have several webinars that we've done on financial capability strategies for people with disabilities that includes um, the exact provisional, you know, the exact language from the regulations that say that individuals will not have a negative impact on their that their tax refunds will not count as income and it will not count as an asset for 12 months. Um, and we can also give you the link from the POMS, which is the Social Security's Policy and Operating Manual, um, just so people can have something in writing. So if folks, um, if folks need anything like that, then you, you are more than welcome to email in to us or to um, show people how to educate themselves on some of these topics by tapping into some of the free webinar archives that are already available to them. Uh, so, Roxy, another question we had was, um, can you share a little bit about free file from the IRS? Sure, so FreeFile is a partnership of different uh, tax filing software programs that have entered an agreement with the IRS to be able to provide their services to taxpayers for free. And each company has different guidelines and rules in terms of their uh, if there are income limits that someone ha must meet to be able to use their services. In, in addition, some of the companies will charge fees for filing state returns, and some of them don't have fees for certain states. So it is another opportunity to find free tax filing assistance, and this would be through the computer. Um, it is something where you do want to look at what each company offers carefully to make sure that if you are in a certain state that you'll be able to file your state return um, for free and without any additional charges as well. Thank you. The next question is, will taxpayers be informed that they should be receiving a 1095A? So, yes. So, taxpayers, the 1095A form is for people who have received uh, health insurance through the health insurance marketplace. And so if someone has gotten insurance through the health insurance marketplace, they should receive some type of notification that they um, should be receiving this, this form. If they haven't received the form, there is a way to go to the website, healthcare.gov, and there is a link there that will be able to provide people more details, and I believe they're also making available a way where people can um, download forms as well. Uh, I'd have to actually double check on the status of that. Uh, that is one option that I know they were intending to make available. Thanks. Sorry for that pause, everyone. I couldn't get my phone off mute. Um, one more question is, do you know if there'll be any new opportunities for savings at tax sites this year? Opportunities for savings at tax sites do include some of the options that have been available before. So we do have the option to purchase savings bonds as well as to split refunds. And what that means is someone can have their refund uh, that split into up to three different accounts. So if someone has a dedicated savings account or wants to start a savings account, then they can do that and have a portion of their refund also go into their checking account. Um, so those are the options that will be available again. And at this time, I haven't heard of something that's completely new that will be offered. Great, thank you. 
Uh, so we don't have any more questions, but I did want to make one comment and then open it up to Roxy and Jenny to see if they had any other comments. I just wanted to um, note that I took a look at the attendance for today, and a lot of you on the line are from disability organizations and from workforce centers. And so I just want to um, say a thank you to you, each of you, for joining us today because Individuals with disabilities have been noted by the IRS as a population of people that are still continuing um, to not to claim their earned income credit. And so the power of what you can do in just sharing this information with those that you serve and guiding them towards the resources that will best suit them is, is incredibly powerful. And I just want to take a moment to thank each of you for taking your time to join us. Um, Roxy or Jenny, do you have any um, kind of final thoughts before I close us out? Well, I would like to thank everyone also for joining this webinar, taking time to learn about tax benefits that are available, and certainly encourage others to do one thing. I know there was a lot of information we shared during this webinar, so just take one thing uh, to be able to share with your community. And I do want to remind people that we do have resources available on our website, and our new 2015 outreach kit is available as well. So you can find the links and information online, and if you'd like to receive a printed copy in the mail, you can request that as well. And you know, Roxy, maybe we'll just answer one more question before we go, and that is, is there a, are there free tax services available for individuals who operate a business and need to file their taxes? Okay, so that's a good question. It, it depends on the type of business and the nature of the business, so there are actually some uh, VITA sites that have been involved in opportunities to provide free tax filing assistance as well as some coaching and support to certain self-employed workers. Um, they had to meet some income guidelines and a couple of other requirements. Uh, so in general, self-employment is out of scope for many free tax preparation sites. And to my knowledge, there's not a specific initiative um, that is dedicated to providing free services for uh, self-employed workers. There are some VITA sites that do still offer that assistance. And so maybe later on, Elizabeth, you can send me the location of where that person is and I can just check to see if there's a site where they are that does offer that service. That'd be great, thank you so much. So the person who asked that question, if you could email me, as well as the individual who asked a personal question about the sale of their home and the receipt of SSDI, please email me, it's ejennings at ndi-inc.org. So on that note of the offer of extended help as you should need it, um, we hope that you'll, we'll, you'll do that, you'll reach out to us as you need additional assistance and that you'll join us in 2015 for a new season of webinars offered by the Real Economic Impact Network. And we do already plan to have the center back on with us um, and we look forward to that opportunity. So another thank you to Roxy and to Jenny and to all of you for joining us today. I hope you have a very happy holiday season and that you'll um, join us again next year and connect with us um, over the holidays. Thanks everyone, have a great end of the year.